Welcome to episode 14 of the Weekly Stash. My name is Steve McGauley, and with me as always is Ed Garrett and Joseph Gagel. This week, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a lot of movies, movies and, and television and some comics, but we cover the whole gamut as we do every week. So without further ado, let's dive right into really what the news of the day was here, here Monday. Uh, kind of worked out waiting to do the podcast today because... This morning we got the second full-length, really the first full-length trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy. Two and a half minutes of awesomeness, and to, to put it briefly. But I know, Joe, you were, you were geeking out before we started the podcast talking about it, so why don't you run us through what you, uh, what you saw? Well, I, you know, I watched it on my lunch break today two or three times in a row just because it, you know, brought out the kid in me, I guess. But it, it was, it looked really great. Um, like getting to hear Bradley Cooper as Rocket, and uh, also got, you know, towards the end, if you if you're patient long enough, towards the end, you get to hear a little bit of Vin Diesel. I am Groot. So, yes, it, finally. It finally. looked it looked great. It looked even better than the first. We saw a little bit of the you know some of the stuff in the first, but definitely a lot of new stuff. And uh, really excited, even more so about this. And we also as you as I as I showed you, we also dropped a new uh, movie poster as well, which looks equally as awesome. Yes, I cannot wait to put that up next to my theater. It is going to be awesome. It does look it does look phenomenal. Check it out. It's a uh, we have the trailer and everything up on our website. Uh, you can also check it out at Marvel. But uh, definitely, definitely watch watch that trailer. It is up now on TMStash.com. It looks phenomenal. I can't wait. It is the movie I'm looking forward to the most. Uh, we also have X Men obviously coming up this week, so that's gonna be that's gonna be cool. Look for our our review sometime uh, this week on that. So I'm ex- I'm excited to see that, but not as excited as I am about Guardians. The Guardians is going to be it's going to be awesome. So uh, with that being said, go watch it. But uh, let's uh, dive into some comic book stuff. And Ed, I know uh, you had read the the first uh, first issue of Superman Doom, where you know we thought it was going to be Superman versus Doomsday, but Doomsday's dead. Well, there's a whole twist of this thing. Uh, Superman Doomed, they had three different issues out this past week. Superman Doomed, number one, Action 31, and uh, Superman and Wonder Woman came out as well. And what they've done is, and, and I'm going to spoil some stuff here, so you can plug your ears for a moment and I'll do this again. I'll actually remember to wave this time. Uh, Superman and Doomsday have their big fight, but it's over in Superman Doomed. He literally tears Doomsday apart limb from limb, Doomsday turns into some sort of particulate cloud, spores, what have you, and to keep Doomsday from affecting more things, he literally inhales all of that himself. Uh, now Doomsday had gotten so powerful that if he stepped in the waters, the waters turned black. The forest would catch on fire around him, and Superman was the only living being who could survive more than ten minutes in Doomsday's presence, much less fight him. So the fact that he beat him was amazing, but now Superman is changed and turning into a doomsday himself. And this is, I'll wait here for people to come back. The big thing with this series is going to be a lot about trust. Who can Superman trust and can he be trusted? And there's a lot of folks wanting to do different things. Luther wants to do some quarantine. Wonder Woman wants him to get away and, and survive. Uh, but there's a lot going on in this series, and it's actually extremely well written. But you've got Scott Snyder, Greg Pak, and Charles Soule all working together, and all three are excellent writers, and their combination is just dynamite. When, when the New 52s first started, I was really thrilled with the Superman books, and it looked like it just lost its steam, and I, I wasn't as happy except for... Superman Wonder Woman, where the where Soul seemed to get those characters, and they were really better in that book than in their own individual titles. Uh, right now, everybody's up on their A game, and if you're not jumping onto this series, I think you're going to miss out. It's it's an exceptional series, and I, I can't wait to see what more they do this summer with Superman and dealing with the Doomsday virus. Sounds like an interesting twist. Seems pretty cool. Well, yeah, and I'm glad, I'm glad they're not rehashing the old stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Go ahead, Joe. 
I was saying, I wonder, wonder if Batman just says, ah, let's just shoot a kryptonite rocket at him and get it, be, be done with it, you know? <laughs> you know the, the funny thing is, it's not so much there, but right now you get to see, you know, in the New 52, they've been slowly building the trust between these two. And uh, without spoiling too much, one of the things that Superman does is he literally hands Batman a key to the fortress. Wow. Yeah, although although when Batman started reacting to it, he said, well, don't get too proud because Wonder Woman also has a key. <laughs> you, you'd figure with those to an item, she would have a key to his place. Well, yeah. <laughs> but Naturally. but it's still pretty amazing. But, yeah, there's a lot going on in this series, and it's going to bring in basically the entire super cast, all the Justice League, everybody. It's it's going to be pretty awesome. Sweet. Look forward to see where that series goes. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And speaking of another kind of new series with the original Sin hitting, uh, was it last week? We're already starting to see some crossovers. Yeah, and uh, Avengers number 29 is the first tie-in, and this uh, is the first uh, issue to explore a secret or a sin that, that's coming to light, and it has to do with Captain America. In the earlier days of the New Avengers, Captain America was a member, and the New Avengers were the Illuminati, which were basically a small group of the Avengers who were more worldly and would make decisions on their own, pretty much. You know, if we're, we're going to make a weapon to, you know, solve a future doomsday crisis, you know, like mad scientists almost. And when he, when Captain America found out their their plans and their goals, he was like, "I can't let you do this." So they. Uh, they already had a plan because him and him and uh, Tony Stark have always, you know, kind of like Batman and Superman have always kind of butted heads on things. And he had uh, Doctor Strange basically zap zap his mind, and you didn't you didn't remember this? You were never a part of the Illuminati. Bye. Now he's starting to remember these things. He's starting to remember what these people that he called friends have done to him. And he's not too happy about it. So, and it kind of leaves it like that. And I'm sure that, plus a lot of other storylines, are going to be brought out as part of the this uh, secret revealing uh, story. Oh, I hope that doesn't turn out like there was a similar thing they did sometime back in DC, where they had Zatanna of mind wipe a whole bunch of people. Uh, that one didn't turn out so well. I hope this one turns out better. <laughs> Yeah, we we will we will definitely see about that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, kind of going along with comic books and stuff, we also had the badass trailer for Flash. Oh my goodness, wonderful trailer for the Flash! There's a lot that's in there. Uh, they've got some version of the Reverse Flash thrown in there. Uh, just before the New 52, they had thrown in where the Reverse Flash went and killed Barry's mother, went back in time and did that. Uh, that's sort of been unresolved in the New 52, but obviously they've gone back to that because you do see that flashes of yellow uniform around his mother in the, in the previous scene. You also see the Weather Wizard, and it looks like they're going to go with meta-based powers for the rogues. Um, the, the name they used for the Weather Wizard is actually the name in the comics of the Weather Wither, Wizards Can't Talk, Brother. Uh, but there's a whole lot going on in that. The way he gets the uniform is real interesting. Uh, bringing in Iris is very interesting. And and just the, the joy that he carries in it. This, this Barry Allen is, he's a bit of a nerd and a geek, which he is in the comics. Uh, he's got that sort of hopeful joy that goes with being the Flash that you see in the comics. Uh, it, it just the way they're depicting his super speed, the relationship with with Arrow that they've got in there, it looks amazing. It, I'm, I'm they nailed up this. they nailed the casting and the character. It already you can already tell that. And the yeah. costume. You know, the, there's some controversy over the costume in Flash fan circles though because it's a darker color. Uh, oh, I don't mind. Gosh. I I know, but you know, it's it's not just a darker color, but it's also if you notice the chest symbol. In the comics, there's white in the circle. In the TV series, it's a dark burgundy in the circle. I think it's okay. I knew they would do some changes on it. It beats the crap out of the 1990s uh, Flash costume, and I even like that old series, but it, it beats that costume a lot. And it works for this character. It works for how they're playing him. Uh, so I, I'm looking forward to it. 
And yeah, my, 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 I can, my, I can hear this with the what the what they do with the logo on his chest or or what color red his flipping costume is. All I care is that they nail the character and that it's a badass series, and it's pretty much shown in every way so far that it's going to follow right in the path of the arrow and start crossing over, which is it's going to be awesome. You know, and, and that's really what they're aiming for. They're looking for fans like me that are big fans of the Flash. We might say things about the color of the costume or whatever, but we're going to be there. They're looking to grab more casual fans like you that, that have heard of the character but may not be as big on the character as I am and draw more people in. And if that works, wonderful. So I'm, I'm cool. See, uh, see, what's awesome about this is that what Marvel's done so well in the movie theater. Uh, I mean, not to take away against Batman, that you know, Batman's were awesome, but they didn't create the universe. What they're doing more so now on TV is creating that DC universe better than any movie has ever done to date. That's true. So that's what's probably the coolest thing is that you're actually finally going to get to see kind of the DC universe come to life on a big screen, if you will. It, this being television, maybe we'll see more with the movie with the Batman vs Superman that comes out in a year or two. So I think it maybe next year is it next summer? Ne- next year, same date as uh, Captain America. That's right, same day. Yeah. So that's. That, that's promising, but the TV shows are awesome. So I hope that this continues forward and maybe we even get to see more characters come to life on TV because the CW is nailing it with these characters. Well, and that's my favorite thing about the, the this trailer sneak peek is that they show him go back to Oliver for advice because that's where the show the show gets its roots from Arrow. It, you know, the they, they did the 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 small origin story there, mm-hmm. and and th- that to me that also confirms that I always believed it. But they are going to cross this over, and it uh, the pot to me the possibilities are endless. And and, and I'm a, I'm a Marvel guy, and this is my favorite show, Arrow. So yeah, I mean exactly. I mean, and the kind of is a is an easy segue. I mean, Arrow was was awesome. The finale was awesome, and the coolest thing about probably the Arrow is that you kind of thought that at the end of the show, even all the way up until the end, without giving away too many spoilers, you kind of thought like the whole island story was over. Like you knew yeah. that they were going to wrap it up, and they do, and you kind of think, oh well, I guess that's the end of the backstory. We'll move forward, but then at the end they cliffhang you, and they're gonna they have there's more backstory that they're gonna go back to. And they're going to well, continue that's... with these flashbacks, continue doing this storyline of you know, what happened on the island in the past and what's happening in the current, which was so cool. And that's one of my big, well, was one of my biggest questions and concerns is, to me, one of the things that makes the show great is the flashbacks. And I always wondered, what are they going to do when they run out of island time? What, you know, how, do, you know, how do they take that greatness and carry it on? And they, they answered that a little bit, I think. So I'll definitely be looking forward to and tuning into that this next fall. In the end, even kind of in in the way that it ends with the island, I will say that much, almost leaves it open for them to start bringing in more DC characters. Absolutely. With the creation, with what they create at the end of that episode, they completely open it up to where the universe can start taking shape. And it, it's it's really cool that Arrow's done so well and that they're kind of using it as the backbone that they can continually slowly work this out and not just kind of dive all in. They got the Flash going after season two of Arrow, which is great. But it's cool they're slowly adding these characters and you can see them just adding more and more and more and building up you know, that DC universe like I talked about. So that's what I look forward to the most is seeing how this goes. So hopefully people will continue watching so they don't end up canceling either one of the shows and really just killing what that universe can become. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they've got a good foothold, and CW isn't trigger-happy like Fox and all the other uh, companies are about just killing off TV shows if they're not getting 10 million viewers a night. So uh, with that being said, oh, Agent, 
Agents of Shield. We didn't talk about that. That was awesome too. That wrapped up as well, and that at the end was every almost as good as as Zero is its first season. So a little bit weaker of a start, but man, it it did it really did pick up, and it looks like Marvel's going to start creating their own TV universe with. With Agents of Shield getting picked up for a new season, and Agent Carter, is that going to be a summer show or is that coming on in the fall? Actually, this past week, I think it was released that it is going to be a winter series to bridge the gap in between the mid-season finale. So from I guess uh, November, you know, late November, early December to January, February is going to be Agent Carter to kind of bridge the gap, and because it's a, I, I, I'm assuming it's going to be a S.H.I.E.L.D. origin story-ish, I assume that maybe uh, since this uh, next season will kind of be like a new S.H.I.E.L.D., like they're rebuilding S.H.I.E.L.D., maybe this will kind of help segue that story, you know, with, with this new origin, with an old origin, maybe. And, uh, you know, the I thought the show ended really, really, really good, I even know some people who were huge Arrow fans that said, I don't know which one was better, which finale was better. Because they both had a lot of uh, a lot of loose strings to, you know, to kind of lead you on to the next uh, season. The, one of the things, I just want to get this out there, as, a, as a, you heard it here first, I have a theory that Skye and her parents, they could be bringing in humans into this. And that's my little theory. Because I've I've done a little bit of in human in humanity research lately, and it it kind of seems like this could be something they're doing. So it's I don't know. We probably could spoil it. I mean, it it probably doesn't matter that much if you're that into the show. You probably watched it by now. Uh, but, hopefully. But uh, I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, your DVR, but. I don't know. So, you know, they they keep their lips closed on their secrets. So, I'm looking forward to next season though, and especially. Uh, with how they're going to, you know, Age of Ultron, this this could, you know, because this is the only thing Marvel has. After Guardians of the Galaxy, it's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. from August to the summertime. So they're going to have to do some kind of Ultron touch or tie-in. They have to, because that's all they have to, to build on between now and then. Yeah, one would think. One would think that would be the natural transition. So, I mean, hopefully they do, because I think if they do, that'll really carry the story the way that it needs to go, so it doesn't fall flat, kind of how the beginning of the of the series was. Because they're because so. they're not gonna they're not gonna have a uh, a Captain America and a Thor movie to tie in to Agents of Shield. They're not gonna have any movies to tie into the the show, which to me is you know obviously Captain America's tie in is what really kicked the show into fifth gear. Well, in theory, you could uh, you could carry in Guardians from the summer because that should the TV show should start back up September. Yeah, I mean you could but the time frame. So I mean that's right after like Guardians should be exiting the box office. So you could have some Guardians crossover at the beginning, too, could, depending on how where they take the story with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, but if you remember what we talked, I think we talked about last week. We talked about how. You know, it's episodes five through ten is where you really need to keep the steam rolling in a season, mm -hmm. and and they're not gonna have a, a a box office film in the in those episodes or even the latter episodes to to help pump the steam. So they're gonna have to this season is gonna have to really rely on its own steam to to succeed. I think. Yeah, definitely. And, and really, speaking of box office thr thrills, this weekend Godzilla made ninety-eight million dollars, which, as you can see, I've got the poster behind me. I was lucky enough to get a sneak peek of it last uh, last Monday, but unfortunately, it was embargoed until Friday. But I did get the review up to the site, so go check out my review. But to kind of sum it all up, it was Gareth Edwards who. Uh, his first movie he directed was a movie called Monsters, which he made himself for like $2.6 million doing all the special effects on his MacBook Pro and uh, literally did the whole movie that way and kind of, d with his limited budget, kind of did this whole Spielberg thing who he's greatly inspired by. And uh, 
did this thing where you know he didn't really show a lot of the monsters just because his budget didn't allow him. He was doing all the CG effects himself, so he kind of left this suspense of you know what are these monsters, who are these monsters, and he really kind of wanted to carry that into Godzilla, which which he does effectively and it's cool to a degree, but he had this vision. You you could tell watching the movie that. Uh, Edwards had this vision of, you know, I want to build a story around Godzilla, not just this Godzilla creature that goes and destroys cities that we've seen time and time again over the number of years. But he he harkens back to the original Gojira movies, which were, you know, really movies about, uh, back then, you know, Fukushima, or not Fukushima, but uh, the... Uh, what am I trying to think of? The uh, atomic bomb that goes off in Japan. So they, they were really a... Terranobu or Sakaguchi. Right. But, I mean, they were they were pretty much pieces, you know, that were political pieces, if you will. And he kind of harkens back to that a little bit, which is kind of cool to a degree. But he really tries to build this whole thing around these characters in the beginning of the movie. But... The script was so terrible that you don't really feel anything for the characters. I mean, you kind of... I mean, the trailer gives away that... Uh, that Joe's wife dies. Joe's played by uh, none other than Heisenberg himself. Heisenberg. What? <laughs> <laughs> I was just whispering Heisenberg. <laughs> So, so I mean, it's really cool to have Cranston in there, and you really kind of thought he was going to carry the movie. And then, spoiler alert, he dies 20 minutes into the movie. Ah. So, like, this whole idea of having Cranston carry the movie, like, kind of goes away. You knew his wife was going to die. I mean, they show it in the trailers, pretty much her dying. So, I mean, that, I mean, you kind of feel for that a little bit, but it just kind of falls flat. And it's got it's about him and his son, and his son comes back from war. His son goes, comes back, has to bail his dad out of jail because he's so hell bent on trying to figure out what caused this uh, nuclear plant to collapse. And he they write it off as a natural disaster. He thinks it's something else. Obviously, you know it's Godzilla or some other creature. And then next thing you know, you see Fukushima's being there. What looks like Fukushima? I mean, for real, it looks just like the power plant. So, uh, in Japan, there he's in Japan, and they they're using it to keep these ugly ass pterodactyl looking Godzilla creatures. I forget what they're called. They have a name, but I'm not that big into the Godzilla universe to know all that. So, you have these creatures. They break out and they start wreaking havoc. And the coolest parts of the last 45 minutes of the movie where you kind of finally get to see Godzilla, which you don't you don't really get to see him. You get glimpses of him going through the ocean and this and that. So he tries to build this suspense of, you know, when am I going to get to see him? And that's really cool. The coolest part is how he humanizes Godzilla and makes Godzilla a real person. Because Godzilla ends up, you know, being the savior of the movie. So fighting against these pterodactyl-like creatures that are destroying Hawaii and the West Coast. So that part he successfully does. And the last 45 minutes is badass. It is awesome. You have this epic war between Godzilla and these creatures, and it's really good. But the first half of the movie, the first two acts, are really weak. It's, I, I know a lot of people have really liked it. Uh, I know some people that didn't. I know some really hardcore Godzilla people that kind of had the same opinion that I did when I talked to some some of the reviewers and some of the press out outside of the movie afterwards. Kind of had the same feeling, but it's kind of this toss up: was was the last forty five minutes good enough to save this movie? Some thought it was. Some thought it wasn't. And, I mean, if, if you're a Godzilla fan, go see the movie for sure. Get out there and, and go see it before X-Men comes out. If you're not, 
wait and rent it, red box it. I don't know that. I don't know personally. Luckily, I got to go for free, but I, I personally would not spend the ten to fifteen dollars probably to go see it. If you did, you may just want to go show up for the last hour. <laughs> you won't. You won't miss much. I told you enough right now that you can just skip the first hour, fifteen minutes, and catch the end of it, and it'll be way better. <laughs> what, what about a sequel, Stephen? What do you think about that? Uh, sequel has already been actually. I don't think it's been officially greenlit, but I know that they started working on a script after the opening box office numbers of ninety-eight million, and they definitely left the end of the movie open for a sequel. And, so I won't uh, ruin the ending of the movie, but uh, it's it's open for for a solid sequel. I just the, hope that Edwards comes back to direct, and I hope they get somebody else to write the movie. And since I think it could have it, it had the it it had the making to be really awesome, and it was just sad that the script and the writing behind it didn't seem to match what. Edward's view of what he wanted this movie to be and what it probably what it should have been is it's kind of, that's probably the most disappointing part is what what it could have been and should have been just didn't come to light because of a poor script. And uh, this is my last bit on it. Since you've seen it, do you feel like the sequel will have the similar grounded approach, or do you think we'll get to see some more monsters in the mix like Mothra? I mean, with that, the way they kind of, you know, the beginning of the movie, they kind of starts off with them finding artifacts and what appears to be the skeleton of a dead Godzilla-like creature. Huh. And literally there's this giant sack of basically baby Godzillas in this dead carcass that they find. They find two of them. And there's these literally giant glowing sacks of somehow living organisms and something hatches from the sack and goes into the ocean and that's how you get these pterodactyl crazy creatures. So hmm. those technically still exist. So something of similar magnitude could happen again with a sequel. So I don't I don't know if how they'll how they'll try to do that, but there's definitely something there for them to make another another Godzilla movie, and it looks like they will probably have one within the next couple of years. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it's a little bit better than this one. I hope I just hope that Edward gets to direct it because I think he's awesome and I think he did a fantastic job. The CG effects on in the movie are amazing. Outside of the fact that they made these ugly ass pterodactyl creatures. Uh, but the CG is fantastic, and the special effects are great, phenomenal, even. So I hope a lot of stuff stays the same. I just want it better written. <laughs> that's all. It's the only thing really killing this movie is is just a, a terrible story that doesn't properly build any character development. I should say a little character development. Just not well done. Cool. That pretty much wraps it up for what we have this week. You guys have anything to add? Anything you want to catch up next week? I've got some uh, comics coming up here real quick. Just to hit uh, DC has got Forever Evil number 7 finally coming out. This is one that's been delayed. It'll give the final fate with the crime syndicate. Uh, we'll find out what happens to Dick Grayson. We already know... It's not much of a spoiler to say we know he's going to survive because there's going to be a new series already solicited called Grayson. But what we don't know is uh, why does the rest of the DC Universe still consider him dead? So we'll see a little bit more about that. Justice League 30 comes out where their newest member, Lex Luthor, joins the team. Wow. Oh. Yeah, there'll be some folks quitting, some other folks joining like Lex Luthor and maybe Captain Cold, which I think would be awesome. Uh, over at Image, it's a big week. Invincible hits number 111. They're starting a new arc. Uh, I've seen an advanced look, and without spoiling anything here, wow. It's it's going to be pretty awesome. If you're like Invincible at all, 
Saga has issue 19 coming out with a new arc. Uh, there's new ones from Rocket Girl, which has got some of the best art in comics today and a great script, and Ghosted. Uh, Dark, uh, Dynamite has Solar Man of the Atom from Frank Barbieri and uh, Magnus Robot Fighter from Fred Van Linty. Uh, Dark Horse has Brain Boy, Men from Gestalt, number one, and a Star Wars Darth Maul comic, uh, number one. And then over at Valiant, this is a big week for them. Exo Man of War, number 25, comes out. Uh, this is a big uh, milestone issue for them. It leads into Armor Wars, uh, which is pretty awesome. And then Unity number 7 comes out, which is uh, the last uh, big gasp for Dr. Silk. Who, if you're a Ninjak fan, you'll really get into that one. So it's going to be a great week over in the Indies. Uh, Boom will have Translucent number 2 and, uh, and some of the regular Adventure Time and other stuff that a lot of guys like grabbing over there. So big week. What about over at Marvel? Well, uh, got some good stuff this week. Uh, Original Sin number two, which will carry that uh, main storyline forward with the the mystery of death of the Watcher. Uh, another really good, indep not independent, but you'll know what I mean when I say it. And the new Magneto comes out. That's been a really good so far. It's up to issue number four. Uh, pretty big X Men week. We've got a uh, Wolverine and the X Men. The Tomorrow Never Learns story continues with a Apocalypse Phoenix uh, type story. Uh, the Amazing Spider-Man shows up in The Amazing X-Men. Uh, we have Uncanny X-Men number 21, X-Factor number 8, Deadpool Annual number 2. The cover uh, has him wearing Spider-Man's suit. Like he took it and, it, and he's going in the cover. He's got his mask up and he's doing the shh. So that, that looks like it might be pretty neat. And with that, we've got The Amazing Spider-Man number 2, which, ha which features Electro on the cover to probably go with the film so looks like a pretty good week with us as well sweet awesome well that pretty much wraps up the show thanks so much guys and uh, thanks everybody for watching leave your comments below but uh, keep reading the stash and have a good night good night guys <laughs>